I'm going to talk about research we've been doing over the past few years focused on building systems that are able to sense, adapt, and respond to human emotions. And I'm not, a, I'm not in the gaming industry per se, uh, but a lot of the things we're trying to build, I think, have a lot of potential and applicability in, in gaming contexts. Uh, but like me, how many people uh, out there would appreciate some kind of assistant that would help them with the things they're doing in their daily lives to, to make extra use of the, the hours in the day? Yeah. Um, I think well, one of the things I love about science fiction is that uh, it gives us a vision of what things you know, might or could be like in the future. Um, some of those are good, some of those are bad. Uh, but what we uh, continually see, I think, in these characters is the fact that they have the ability to express and understand emotion. And that's what helps humans and machines collaborate. And one of the things that systems that we interact with currently are lacking is that those soft skills, the ability to understand and communicate rich nonverbal information. Even R2-D2 with squeaks and beeps can communicate a lot about how the system is feeling. And it shows just how, really, how little um, a modality you need in order to, to communicate a lot of information to humans. But it, currently, we can't do a lot of that. Um, but emotions are central to our experiences, to our daily life, to our well-being. And in order to help people and create experiences that are more enjoyable, less frustrating, I believe that we need to create systems that can understand and reflect human emotion. Uh, I love this example. It came up on Twitter recently. Um, someone posted uh, a, a book explaining computers to a child, saying that computers don't understand feelings such as happy or sad. They don't know what you mean exactly. And while that's, a lot of that's true, there's technology that already exists that can help us get a lot closer to building a system that can do some of those things. Uh, so the question I kind of want to ask you to think about in the next hour is what will games look like when human emotions act as an interface? So how will that change how you design uh, a system uh, if you can create characters that in real time can adapt to what your uh, player is expressing, uh, what they're saying, and you can do that all end, end to end in an autonomous fashion. Uh, we are building systems that leverage the wide array of sensors that are available in, in our home environments now. And uh, the things I'm going to focus on in particular are uh, cameras and microphones and how those sensors, which are you know, very ubiquitous uh, in, in all sorts of devices, your, your laptop, your cell phone, uh, many TVs, can be used to capture really quite um, interesting information about the experiences of people who are interacting with technology. Uh, these are the types of things that we're building machine learning algorithms to sense. Uh, so we do uh, fundamental you know, kind of work looking at face detection and tracking. Uh, that enables us then to uh, look at the texture of the face and uh, analyze and predict facial expressions, facial actions. We, uh, I'll show some methods we can use to extract physiological information from these sensors. And uh, we're also looking at, at this multimodally, so looking at audio information to uh, analyze language, sentiment, and voice tone, prosody, things like that. Uh, here's just a, a quick kind of demo that shows you what we can capture just from a video, regular RGB video. So what you see here is the face being tracked, the uh, facial expressions being um, analyzed, uh, some basic demographic information being extracted from the image, and also the heart rate being calculated from uh, very subtle color changes. And these, these kind of algorithms are now somewhat commoditized. So there are many APIs, Microsoft has APIs, but other, many other companies and startups do too, where you can send video um, and or audio and extract information about people's emotional state. Uh, 
And while these are not perfect, and they're certainly not at the level of a human being, what they do enable is highly scalable measurement. So you can send vast amounts of video and audio to these uh, types of services and extract information where it would have been impractical, uh, in many cases impossible, to do that manually or using some, um, some other type of approach. During my PhD, what I did was apply these algorithms to a very large data set we collected where we had uh, people volunteer to opt in, share their webcam feed, much like uh, someone might on Twitch or some other platform, um, while they watched content, so while they were consuming content. Uh, we analyzed uh, over millions and millions of videos of people around the world from different countries. And what's really nice about this is it takes uh, the type of understanding research we can do outside of the lab and into people's homes. And this is something the psychologists kind of wish uh, they could do uh, in the past and now is possible through, uh, through the internet and, and algorithms that can automate measurement. Uh, so we ran facial uh, coding classifiers on uh, these images and were able to reveal some really interesting things. So uh, first of all, uh, cultural differences uh, exist, and many of these things reinforce uh, understandings and theories in psychology uh, that uh, show that people in the, the US tend to be a lot more expressive, particularly um, in positive emotion, uh, than people in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, these relationships are uh, Quite, quite strong in some cases. So these are effects are, are, are non-trivial and can be uh, observed across very, very large numbers of, of countries. And they can be understood in terms of social norms. So when we analyze people's non-verbal or emotional um, expressions, we have to bear in mind that what we express is a product not only of how we're feeling, but also the culture uh, and the place that we come from, because uh, social norms have a huge effect on what is appropriate or not appropriate to express at any one time. Using scalable measurement, we can start to quantify for the first time uh, these types of relationships, which is really exciting if we want to build systems that are more intelligent than just detecting a smile and saying someone's happy, because in many cases, people smile even when they're not happy. So we need to build these rich models that take into account social norms, cultural differences, uh, in order to build real intelligence into a, a, a system that is understanding uh, emotion. Another example is uh, differences in, uh, between men and women that we observe, again, which uh, reflect the social norms that exist and are quite uh, consistent across many different countries. So uh, what we ob observe is that there's a stronger social norm uh, for women to smile than there is for men, and a, a stronger social norm for men to show more aggressive uh, behavior like brow furrowing and anger than, than there is for women. Uh, these, these relationships don't mean that men are more angry and women are more happy. It's, it's that there's a social norm that in these cultures that exists that uh, reinforces certain types of behaviors. Again, it's important to quantify this so that we don't make uh, very simplistic interpretations of someone's behavior. Something you might not be aware of is we can use a video to extract more than just facial expressions. By analyzing very subtle changes in color intensity, we can measure physiological information, so changes in physiology that the person's experiencing. And this is measured through blood flow. Uh, so we did some early work, um, again, during my PhD at MIT, where we were looking to extract heart rate, respiration rate, uh, heart rate variability from uh, videos in order to get, get a richer picture of how someone was feeling. Because these physiological signals reflect what's going on inside their body, whereas facial expressions are a more outward sign. Uh, more recently, we've, we've applied deep learning, uh, which you might be familiar with, to this problem to improve the accuracy. What you see uh, here on the left-hand side is a, a video uh, of three different individuals. Um, 
the second image is showing you where the algorithm is focusing in the image to extract the heart rate. So it's focusing particularly on the forehead, on the neck, uh, in order to pick up the pulse information. And then the red lines are the ground truth, so from a contact sensor. And then the blue lines are what the camera is able to extract. So you, sh you can see it's very uh, closely able to uh, extract the pulse information. Um, and uh, this is just regular RGB video, so it's nothing, it's nothing special about this camera. Uh, it's just a regular, uh, regular camera that you might find um, on, a, on a cell phone or on a, on a laptop. We're working to make these algorithms more robust to things like head motions and lighting changes so that they can be applied uh, in real-world settings. Uh, imagine you wanted to create a game that could adapt in real time to someone's uh, a level of cognitive stress. Um, that's something we can, we can measure through heart rate variability and other sympathetic nervous system activity. Uh, one thing that might surprise you about this signal is we can measure it um, at quite uh, significant distances. Uh, so even uh, at distances of 25 or 50 meters, a camera with an appropriate lens can measure the heart rate of another individual. So I could uh, set up a camera here which uh, could measure the heart rate of someone across the other side of the room. And that's one of the advantages of using cameras versus contact sensors. You can do it at distance, uh, but you can also measure multiple people at the same time. So from a single uh, video uh, of a crowd or a group of people, uh, we could extract the physiological responses of each individual. Another thing we can do with video is visualize this signal, which uh, again is not very easy to do with contact sensors because the information is from a, a very specific location on the body. Uh, but using, uh, again, deep learning algorithms and kind of reversing the algorithm uh, and magnifying the signal, we're able to produce videos that allow you to visualize what the, the machine is actually reading. So what you see on the left-hand side here is an input video. On the far right, um, focus on her forehead, and you'll see the pulsing, the color change uh, happening. And there's uh, another example here, which is uh, blown up a little bit, so it's a bit easier to see. Uh, look at the color change on his face. Um, we're magnifying the pulse information, so the blood flow, uh, but we're not magnifying his head motion. So the, algorithm is able to selectively analyze the particular signal that it, or source that it's interested in. Uh, we can do this also for respiration information, which is dominated not by color change, but more by motion of the body. Uh, so in this example, look at his shoulders. Uh, in the input video, the motion is very subtle, difficult to see. But in the output, the magnified video, you can see uh, magnification of his chest uh, going up and down. Uh, magnification allows us to visualize the signal, but also allows us potentially to synthesize it. So uh, we can um, hopefully in future create essentially photorealistic videos where we can augment the physiological um, appearance uh, of an individual. So imagine your character um, not just exhibiting realistic facial expressions, but exhibiting some of these really subtle uh, behaviors like um, blood flow information or respiration uh, in a way that people might not perceive uh, explicitly, um, but in, in research in psychology shows changes people's response to uh, an avatar or, a, or a, an embodied agent. Uh, one thing we did, and I've got a demo of this if you'd like to try it after, uh, after the session, uh, is apply this algorithm on a HoloLens. So a HoloLens uh, aug is an augmented reality display, um, which uh, the device has a forward-facing camera. Uh, so the camera is able to pick up uh, RGB images of uh, someone who's standing in front of you, analyze that to extract the pulse information, and then we overlay a mask onto the the person's face and magnify the, the pulse information. So you, the signal that would be too subtle to see, otherwise you can start to see magnified. And this is a, a very uh, sort of crude way of, of magnifying that signal. You can see the mask is, is uh, not, not particularly blended with the environment or anything like that, but it just 
we wanted to create it to um, provoke a discussion about what it means if people can have devices that can measure information about other individuals and visualize that for them um, when they don't need contact with another person. Uh, that has pot many potential implications, um, but could, could be used in really interesting um, gaming applications, I think, where uh, you want to kind of understand the, the state of another individual um, when you're playing in a, a real-life environment. Uh, so we took this, uh, this demonstration, um, built a simple interface where multiple people wearing these devices in an environment could walk around um, and collect physiological data uh, of people they interacted with. So what you see on the right-hand side there is a map of, of uh, where they've been kind of walking, uh, and each of those red dots reflects uh, a, a measurement of some individual they interacted with, uh, and you can see live information of the heart rates of the people that they are uh, talking to at that, that one time. We can also use other sensors to capture very similar information. Uh, so many of these algorithms apply not just to, to video analysis, but um, also to accelerometer data. Um, work I, I did with uh, Javier Hernandez and Rosalind Picard at the MIT Media Lab was to apply uh, similar types of algorithms to motion sensors on your cell phone, so a accelerometer and gyroscope, uh, which can capture very, very subtle motions uh, of the body. Um, even when a cell phone is in someone's pocket, it can potentially be used to capture your heart rate and respiration rate uh, because of the way your body's moving due to the mechanical flow of blood. And this data can be used to ascertain information about people's identity, about uh, their, their uh, posture, whether they're lying down, standing up, sitting down, um, and is, is, is pretty rich. Uh, and this is, a, again, is another highly scalable way uh, of capturing uh, information about someone's physiological and emotional state. So what are we doing with this sensor data? Well, one thing is measuring it, but then another thing is, well, how do we actually change people's experiences? And that's where I want to spend the second half of this uh, session, is uh, focusing on how we're using this type of data to create more realistic, uh, engaging avatars and uh, conversational agents people can dialogue with. Uh, so what we're doing is building algorithms that take these uh, emotional signals combined with uh, text or, or speech and are able to create naturalistic dialogue that responds uh, to how someone's feeling. So imagine I was to say something um, and that whatever I said was associated with some imagery. In that imagery is going to be some emotional information, whether it's my facial expression or the facial expressions of people around me or uh, the, the valence or emotion of the scene. We want to combine those two pieces of information together uh, and use uh, a neural network to create output dialogue, so create the response the computer gives back to you. Uh, and we've been able to show that by combining this type of visual imagery with textual input, we're able to create dialogue that is, is more emotional and appropriate to uh, the situation. Typically, this is trained off of large uh, text data sets like uh, are available on, on Twitter or Reddit or other types of platforms where you have a lot of text and people dialog uh, dialoguing about different topics. And it, this type of system requires quite a large volume of data to create a model of both the language as well as the, the, the emotional uh, context. Uh, so what we do in this case, this is kind of the traditional way of approaching dialogue synthesis. So we would provide it with the input text and it would generate some response. Now we're going to combine it with information from the images as well as text in order to generate a response. I won't go into the details of the model, but um, I'd be happy to chat about any of the specifics uh, of the types of algorithms we use afterwards. Um, but what this graph shows is that if um, in, uh, if in a, in a specific case we uh, use input dialogue combined with a positive facial expression, what the algorithm is going to do is create 
dialogue responses that are more positive. So the light blue bars are the sentiment of the algorithm without any image information. And the dark blue bars are the responses of the algorithm with, with the image information. So when we input information that is positive, it's going to create dialogues that are more positive. It's going to respond in a positive fashion. Uh, we can also do the same if we, if we input negative facial expressions like sadness or anger. It will create responses that are more negative, uh, that are more uh, sad or, or um, uh, potentially more angry or frustrated. And this is a lot, a lot of this is, is research in progress, uh, but presents a path forward for creating more natural, engaging dialogue. Uh, and what we want to do is, is apply this to um, both embodied and conversational and voice-based conversational agents uh, to create experiences which people can really engage with. Uh, I'm going to show a video now. It's going to, the, the, the volume's a little uh, low, so uh, you might have to listen carefully, uh, of me interacting with one of the conversational agents we've built. Um, it's uh, using this dialogue uh, synthesis approach to synthesize everything you hear from the agent will be uh, completely automated, so no scripting involved. Would you like to see a movie after? Yes, we do. How about an action movie? I'm open to anything. OK. I'd rather watch an action movie, a romance movie, or a thriller. What's your favorite movie? I really like the Marvel movies. I really like the Marvel movies. Which movies do you like? I think my favorite is Iron Man. I've never seen Iron Man 2. Oh, well, maybe we should watch that on DVD. Sounds like a good idea to me. Great. Should we do that on Friday night? That would be great. Awesome. OK, I'll see you then. Uh, so one thing you might be aware of with voice-based systems that exist today is that you can do very structured tasks, but this type of open-ended dialogue where you can have a conversation about social things is still very challenging. Um, but we're getting closer to be able to build systems that you can have more extended, natural conversations with. Um, I should emphasize this system has never seen a movie. It, it doesn't know how to watch a movie. It doesn't have eyes. So the things it's saying are generated from the dialogue model, um, but it, it still doesn't understand its own capabilities, if that makes sense, right? So it can, it can schedule a movie date, but it won't turn up because it, it isn't a thing, right? So um, there, there's a lot to do to still weave in a lot of this common sense understanding of the world uh, into these dialogue models, but we're getting a lot closer. And some of those subtleties, as particularly in the expression uh, of affect and emotion, are getting, are getting much better. And uh, you'll notice in that example, the speech uh, synthesis, the text-to-speech, is still a little robotic. It's quite easy to tell that that's, that's a computer system. Um, but recent work we've done has, has significantly advanced the quality of that synthesis as well um, to allow us to control uh, much more uh, expression within the voice of the agent. We, we run a lot of user studies with these systems, uh, bringing people to um, our lab to interact with these agents. And what we find is that uh, when an agent dynamically adapts to someone's speaking style and their effective um, expression, they tend to trust this agent more. And this reinforces prior research, which has shown that agents that use um, social uh, behaviors, like talking about the weather and things like that, are also trusted more. People tend to trust systems that behave in human, a human fashion. And we don't want to deceive people, but we do want to create experiences that are more natural for people to interact with. We don't want uh, technology to be frustrating to people. We want them to feel like they're understood. Uh, another thing that's really interesting is that 
people with different conversational styles actually evaluate these agents differently. Some people will put more weight on facial expressions of the embodied agent. Other people will put more weight on the dialogue content that they're hearing. And so it's not just a one size fits all. You kind of need to think about the personality of the person who's interacting with the system and what types of things they'll value. We've still got a lot of uh, a lot of work to do to get past some of the uncanny aspects of interacting with these systems, um, but we're getting a lot closer. One thing I'm particularly excited about is ways that we can deploy some of these systems and have the machine actually learn from social behavior it, it observes from people it interacts with. So imagine a little robot that could explore an environment, talk to people, and start to pick up on some of the social norms it observes that people um, it display when they interact with it. Uh, so for instance, one example, a very simple social norm is that when you meet someone for the first time, you tend to smile because that's going to build rapport and going to be a positive thing for your future interaction with that person. That's a, the type of behavior that a system could learn um, almost uh, entirely autonomously by exploring the environment and observing the behaviors of people to it. We've started to do this um, in a more simplistic fashion with uh, self-driving uh, vehicles. We, we haven't applied it to humans or, or embodied agent type systems yet because uh, they're a bit more complex and there's a lot more subtlety. Um, but we're applying um, this approach to self-driving vehicles. These vehicles uh, that we're, we're simulating have the emotional or nervous system response that a human has. So we have humans drive in environments and we measure their physiological response to different situations. So if they start you know, driving fast or turning a corner sharply, they're going to experience some kind of nervous system response. And then we take that data and we train an algorithm that mimics the emotional response of a human. So now the car can explore an environment and experience the types of nervous system response that a human would in those situations. So rather than use collisions as feedback, as a reward signal, we want to use, um, say, calmness as a reward signal. So we want to keep the vehicle as calm as possible, um, and we want to reward it for doing things that are safe, essentially. Ultimately, we want to take this and apply it to the, the embodied agent context as well to learn social behaviors using reinforcement learning. So without having to necessarily explicitly teach the system that a particular behavior means something, we want to use the fact that there are rewards in the real world that we can leverage in order to provide feedback. Uh, so that's the direction we're going. Uh, but I want to leave some time for questions. And also, uh, if you want to try out the, the HoloLens demo, you can uh, come up and, uh, and try that out. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. That was great. I particularly enjoyed the videos. Really, really clear there. Um, I'm going to take questions. I'll hand you the mic. If you can say your questions into the mic so we can capture it for the video, that would be handy. So we'll start with you, sir. You just pass that along. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, really uh, loved it. How, uh, how much progress are you guys making towards detecting sarcasm? Because that's always been a big problem in text analytics. Um, so I'm wondering, with the physiological aspect, there, there's obviously a lot more information that you're able to gather. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Uh, one of the challenges with sarcasm to date has been typically people have been siloed in their domain, domains. So uh, there are people who study facial expressions, people who study speech and language, people who study um, text, and that they have, there hasn't been systems that are truly multimodal. But sarcasm is a great example of a multimodal signal, right? I say something that's kind of mean, but I smile because I'm joking, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not being serious. Uh, and so without the facial expression, just analyzing the text wouldn't give you that information. Uh, and humans take this for granted, right? We, we leverage multimodal information all the time without even thinking about it. Um, but to date, machine algorithms have typically been trained with just one 
modality. Uh, we're moving in the direction of being able to train these richer systems um, and, and also deploy them that leverage that type of uh, multimodal information. But I wouldn't say it's a solved problem, but we're getting a lot closer. Yeah. Uh, hi, great, great presentation. Um, Kimmo Kari from Finland, and I have a question that uh, that uh, can you measure from this video also brain waves, this alpha, theta, and, and this kind of stuff? Because it's, it would be interesting in that sense that if people don't disagree so much or they or they're on their concert and like the same music, their brain waves start to synchronize. Mm -hmm. So that would be pretty interesting to to know as well, probably, in this case. Yeah, I'm, I'm always hesitant to say you can't, but with the technology we have now, that's measuring explicitly blood flow, respiration, and uh, other types of cardiopulmonary signals that are influenced by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, as are brain, uh, brain waves. So we can measure things that are correlated with brain activity because the nervous system controls different organs in a, a correlated fashion. Uh, but explicitly, physically, we don't have a way to take a video and extract brain activity. I mean, with contact sensors, for sure, yeah, you can measure that stuff. But a non-contact measurement is n hasn't yet been discovered for that particular signal. And uh, other question that when, when you are sort of like modeling the knowledge of the surroundings and the world to, to those agents. Um, is your approach primarily uh, by observation or do you, do you use like semantic web database technology as well to sort of like first model the data better for machine learning algorithms? We typically deal with pretty unstructured large data sets uh, where we're learning mappings from inputs to outputs, like with the dialogue example, right? We're, we're observing what a human said, and then we know what a different human said in response to that, and we get the machine to predict, and if it gets it close, then we give it a good reward. If it gets it wrong, we give it a, you know, a negative reward. Uh, in terms of incorporating that sort of uh, common sense understanding of the world from graph-based um, structures we can get from web uh, that's something we, we want to do, and we're close to doing. Uh, but yeah, we, we haven't really, I wouldn't say we've done that in, in a huge amount of depth yet. Uh, and uh, this is partly, again, because a lot of this work is highly interdisciplinary, right? We're dealing with multimodal signals, lots of different um, domains of data, and uh, it's Research has typically been kind of siloed in the past, and we're, we're trying to bring it together, which deep learning allows us to do with these larger networks and training from volumes of data, uh, but something we're, we'd, we'd love to push more into. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Great work. Keep on doing it. Thanks. Thanks. I, I seem to remember some years ago there being some concerns about connect uh, sensing heartbeat and using the information. I, I, I worked for Google for a while and wore Google Glass, so I'm very familiar with people's reluctance mm -hmm. about these things. Just wonder if there's anything you can share about, you know, I understand this was voluntary, but are there, there reactions or have you talked about people who are worried about their cameras on their computers or game systems picking up emotional response that they don't want necessarily to be broadcast? Yeah, uh, that's it's really, really important. So just yeah, just to be clear, in all cases, the, this was ex there was explicit consent to measure these signals, um, and as a researcher, I, the the social kind of norms that are built around this technology are of great importance to me because people will only ultimately adopt things they feel comfortable with, and we have a responsibility as developers to influence those norms in a way that is ethical and, and is appropriate. Um, so I'm, I don't have all the answers, right? There are um, uh, I'm definitely ways you could use this technology in a negative fashion. Um, there's been a lot of 
uh, discourse about this idea of kind of uh, deception and, and you could make these systems respond very realistically without someone realizing that it's a machine. Um, and, and in your example, you know, using sensors that are available in the world without asking consent. Um, that's it's something that needs to be addressed and needs more focus um, and and discussion. Uh, it's something we talk about a lot in, in research, um, but forming those social norms is a is a non-trivial task. How do we uh, how do we engage with broader you know, broader um, groups of consumers and the public to understand what do people find appropriate and reasonable? Uh, because this technology has many good use cases, so we do want to enable those. And to enable those, we need to create systems that can sense this type of data, but we should get there in a way that is, is respectful and sensitive. Um, I don't have all the answers, but it's a really good question. Thanks. Um, hi. Uh, thank, thank, thank oh, thanks, Daniel, uh, for the great presentation. And I, I wonder if you have like an uh, end goal in, in your head of like uh, how it all gonna look like when your research will be done, I know with you or with your future generations, like what's the, uh, how it all may end up, thanks. Uh, personally, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a little simplistic um, to, to phrase it this way perhaps, but you know, I do have a desire to create systems like R2-D2. Like, I, I want to create a system that is more natural um, and fun to, to engage with than a black box that sits on my coffee table, right? I, there's something about human interaction that's really important that's missing from that form factor right now. So that, that's one thing that motivates me. Um, I think there's really positive applications of that. Um, we don't want to replace human human interaction, but there are people who want to live alone but can't because they are you know, elderly and they need support, conversational systems could offer a lot of benefit to someone in terms of helping them um, manage their routine, rem remind them to take medication, but it's, it's much more likely someone's going to form a bond with that type of assistant if it has emotional connection with them. Uh, if it just you know, gives them a text message saying, take your pills, that's probably less motivating than uh, maybe a robot or an embodied agent that can say, hi, I think it's time you should maybe take your pills because I noticed that you haven't taken them. Um, like, I, I want to get to systems that can really help people in these situations where um, perhaps they're losing agency and we don't have enough people to to provide everyone with an assistant or a um, some kind of helper. We can use technology to to solve some of those issues. I believe um, so. That's that's one example. Uh, hello, my my question is about uh, like you said uh, the that software uh, which is uh, measure uh, measuring the heart rate. Uh, it, uh, like you said, it measure the uh, the color of the face and the movement. Like if you have the phone in your pocket, uh, I think that it uh, really depends. Uh, for example, the face of the color it really depends on the lighting. Uh, how many of samples does the uh, AI needs for the correct measuring? Yeah. So I, the algorithm. One thing about deep learning is that. The, these algorithms scale incredibly well with volumes of data. So they, the models don't get bigger. You can just give them more and more data, and they tend to learn better representations. Um, we trained that system that I showed a demo of on approximately 100 hours of video. Um, and there were people with different uh, skin types. Um, we we use the Fitzger Fitzpatrick sorry skin type scale to try to cover um, as many uh, skin tones essentially as possible, and also vary lighting and motion. But it's very much work in progress. So these systems, whether it's face detection or face recognition or physiological measurement, tend to be biased because the training data sets we have are biased. So if we train a 
a system for face detection and we scrape images from the internet to train that system, a majority of the images on the internet are of white people, particularly males, often celebrities, people smiling, right? That's not gonna train the system to detect every type of face in every type of environment. Um, so one thing we're doing is using those graphics environments, so using a, a, a simulated environment to generate data that we can then use to fix some of these biases that the model learns. Uh, one thing we can do with simulation, synthetic data, is we can generate any number of combinations of lighting, head pose, and things like that. So that's something we're exploring. Uh, but it's a very important question. As we deploy these AI algorithms, we need to understand if they treat a particular you know, demographic unfairly relative to another. Neil, hi. Uh, hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I have a question. There was this plot you shown that the, the model responds uh, the, uh, to the text with the same emotion. Basically, you, you smile, this multimodal uh, Input that you give, uh, both facial and textual, gives it uh, more chance to respond with the same emotion. But uh, how, will it argue with you? Will it disagree with you sometimes? And how it will uh, act if, uh, for example, uh, I, I think it was with Microsoft or that uh, Twitter robot that mm -hmm. it was fed uh, only negative emotion and it became extremely negative very quick. Mm -hmm. How would you fight it and what, what, what are you trying to optimize to don't face those question questions? Yeah, that's a good question. So this. This system, on average, learned to produce more positive responses if it received positive imagery. So it didn't, it didn't always do that. That was just the average result. So that's just something to bear in mind. Like the sarcasm case, we hope that given enough data, it would learn that sarcasm is a thing and that in certain circumstances, if someone says something mean with a smile, you might respond in a positive way because it's, it might be that they're joking. Um, but to the, the deeper question is, yeah, how do these what do these systems learn? And actually, Tay is a great example, the Twitter bot. That, was, that system wasn't really given any safeguards. So hu with human involvement, humans pushed it in a direction to act in a way that perhaps wasn't desirable, right? Um, and that raises one question about, well, if we deploy these systems in the world, how are people going to treat them? Because if we treat them in a mean way, they might learn to be mean, right? Like, we, we, they learn from the environment that they're in, and they will learn those patterns. So we have to think about that. We can obviously give them safeguards, right? We can say to the system, never say these words, or never you know, talk about this topic, or things like that. We can do, we can do things, um, but I think, as a scientist, I think that's less interesting because I would, you know, I, I don't want to artificially constrain this system. I would rather educate it in a way that is, is positive. That, that's me as a scientist, right? As a product developer, I'm going to say we'd do the safe thing, right? Because we don't want to release something that is mean to people. But uh, you know, from a scientific perspective, I think it's fascinating to see how systems like these learn from natural interactions with people. What is it that they learn? And what does that tell us about us? Right. Yeah. Hi, thanks for all. Thanks. You're looking like that main hero from that film on first screen. So um, another question. Um, I heard you are not from the gaming industry, but how the game developers can uh, use these functions that uh, emotional artificial intelligence have now. Thanks. How can the film industry, no, the, the, the game, game industry, industry, sorry, the game industry? Yeah. yeah, I think, I think it opens, you know, a lot of new avenues uh, for adaptive experiences within games. Um, they'll, you know, as with any new technology, they'll be quite, perhaps, uh, they won't be very subtle to start with, right? Like you know, mapping um, uh, facial expressions to particular emotion and then using that as some kind of feedback in a system is a relatively like simple way of applying this technology. And I think it, that could be already used um, in conjunction with other types of feedback to, to either optimize a game or create um, a, a new scenario within a game. 
Um, but ultimately, uh, I think this this type of open-ended conversational dialogue has really cool applications um, where you can start to have agents within a game that are entirely simulated have rich conversations with you. Um, you they, they can be dynamic, they can change. Uh, and we're pretty close to having APIs and web services that can provide that type of open-ended dialogue generation. So you could create a game, um, you, know, you know, back in a, a long time, you know, tw 20, 30 or even more years ago than that, there was Eliza, the bot that you could kind of have a conversation with through text. Um, that was more or less sort of scripted. Now we can do things that are way less constrained than that, right? You can talk about any topic. It can come back with reasonable, logical responses. It, you can give it a personality or a persona that you want it to re reflect. Uh, and that's pretty close to being um, like reality. It's, it's, we're talking kind of 12 months, in the next 12 months, there'll be services you can use to do that type of thing. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. And I do have a demo down here, so stop by at the front if you want to try it out.